All right, we're going to talk about the common wound types and the etiology or kind of what's behind those wound types. In the last lecture, we talked about the characteristics of the different wound types and we kind of touched on them very briefly, but now we're going to get more in depth into the cause. As I said before, if you don't treat the cause or address the cause, it doesn't matter what you do with the hole in the patient. If you don't address the whole patient and try to figure out what's going on and all the different factors that are impacting the ability to heal the wound. As we touched on previously, pressure injuries are a localized area of tissue necrosis or tissue death that develops when the soft tissues between the skin surface and an underlying bony prominence are compressed or have other mechanical forces like shear occur and they start to break down, become ischemic, and die. So obviously people who are immobile are at the greatest risk. So you can think through some of the therapy environments that you'll be working in or exposed to and think about the different patient types that have a reduced mobility. Some of the highest risk individuals are those with spinal cord injuries, anybody that's hospitalized, and then um, long-term care facility folks as they are geriatric and uh, decrease their movements. So how do the cells in the local area die? Well, first there's pressure applied to the area that compresses the tissues between the skin surface and the bone. That closes the blood capillaries, causing ischemia. When that happens, the area becomes acidic, which increases inflammation. When the area becomes inflamed, the capillaries in that area actually try to call for more blood flow to that area, which can increase permeability and cause edema in the area. When it starts to swell, the tissues distend from one another and there's an increased diffusion distance. Eventually that causes um, tissue anoxia and death of the cells if the pressure is not relieved. Pressure injuries can occur really anywhere on the body. However, they tend to occur most often where there's a bony prominence or where there's very little subcutaneous fat. So previously we used to think that pressure injuries occurred when there was pressure applied to an area for more than two hours. So you, if you work in long-term care or um, in acute care, you may hear, we need to reposition the patient every two hours. Um, the other thing that we used to hear was that it had to be a certain level of pressure and that it's enough to close the blood capillaries at approximately 32 millimeters of mercury. But really we now know more through our research that there's an inverse time and pressure relationship, which I'll show you in the next slide, where you can have a high amount of pressure for a short period of time causing a pressure injury or a low amount of pressure for a long period of time. Also, we have to look at the individual's um, own hemodynamic factors. How good is our blood flow to the area? Um, are they young? Are they healthy? Are they elderly? Those types of things and then also the specific body location. So the picture on the top right is the back of the scalp. Now that area is at high risk because there really isn't any subcutaneous fat in that area. We basically have skin connective tissue and bone. Um, the bridge of the nose is highly at risk. Um, the sacrum, the heels, so we'll find out a little bit more about specific body areas that are more at risk, but just in general, it's areas with um, a bony prominence and not very much subcutaneous fat. So this slide shows that inverse relationship of time and pressure in the development of pressure injuries. So you can see on the left side, when there's very high pressure, it doesn't take a very long time to develop a pressure injury. On the bottom right, you can have a very low amount of pressure for a long period of time also develop a pressure injury. The dotted line just to the bottom left indicates that if patients have poor blood flow or low, low blood pressure or a decreased heart rate or something like that, um, they're at higher risk for uh, pressure injuries as well. When considering the diagnosis of a pressure injury, and we see a reddened area on a patient's skin who's been immobile, we have to remember to differentiate what's normal and what's not normal. So if you and I sat in a car 
for an hour and got up without moving, we might see two red splotches on our, on our backsides. That's actually normal. That's reactive hyperemia, where the skin is blanchable and it's a normal response to pressure. When the patient has non-blanchable erythema, so the skin remains red and we push our finger on that red tissue for a few seconds and then remove it and it stays red the entire time, that's where we start to differentiate the occurrence of a stage one pressure injury. So as I said before, the areas over bony prominences, prominences are at the greatest risk for ulcerations, but they can occur in other areas of the body as well. A few things to keep in mind are that muscle is way more sensitive to pressure than skin. Also, keep in mind that pressure injuries may not be visible or detectable to the human eye for several days after the pressure was applied. So if you think about it, much of the tissue damage may occur kind of like an iceberg way down at the bottom near the bony interface. And before we even see that on the skin, there'll start to be tissue breakdown um, below the skin surface. This slide shows a pictorial example of the development of a pressure injury. So pe pressure is applied where the arrow is at and damage occurs between the arrow, the top arrow, on the skin surface and the bony surface. You may not even see any evidence of a pressure injury um, on the skin surface, but it's actually occurring between all of the tissues that have been compressed. Diagnostic ultrasound is a wonderful tool that we're starting to utilize in therapy clinics uh, to detect pressure injuries before we're able to visualize them on the skin surface. All right, you've heard me define a few different times or use the word um, shear, and we need to understand the difference between shear and friction. Those are two different forces that have different impacts on the body. So I want you to do a little um, experiment right now. I want you to take your hands and rub them together like you're trying to warm them up. So you're just gonna rub them back and forth like you're warming your hands up. That would be friction. That's when two surfaces move across one another and you can usually feel some heat develop when you do that. Shearing is a force parallel to the soft tissue. So if you take the, your fingertips of one hand and place them on the back of your other hand and you slide the skin around without moving on the skin's surface, um, you can actually kind of slide your skin around. I usually tell people it's kind of like um, sliding the, the skin around on the bird before Thanksgiving, you know. Um, that's shearing force. So it's parallel to the soft tissue. When the body has a shear force applied to it, so the skin is, is gliding over the top of the bone and muscle, the wounds that develop can have a teardrop appearance because they're kind of being sheared um, in a certain direction. And when that happens, you can imagine that undermining that we talked about where we can kind of sweep the Q-tip underneath the, the wound edge. Um, undermining is really common with these types of wounds because the layers are being torn apart from one another. Another risk factor contributing to pressure injury development is moisture. So as we learned with maceration, when the skin becomes moist, it loses its water function barrier and it's, this predisposes the skin to all types of injuries. So pressure injuries are included in that. Moisture can be caused from lots of different um, reasons. So one is wound drainage. So if they do develop a wound, it can drain out and injure the skin that's in the surrounding area. There can be perspiration um, and incontinence is a big one just because um, urine and feces are so caustic to the skin. On the flip side of that coin, uh, skin that is very dry or that's anhydrous is also at risk as well. So we have to make sure that the intact skin has a good moisture balance. As we said before that patients who have impaired mobility are at a very high risk for pressure injuries. So all the settings that you work in where patients are not fully functional and independent, um, you'll have to make sure that you're helping to prevent pressure injuries from occurring, 
monitoring uh, to make sure that the patient doesn't develop a pressure injury, and then utilizing your expertise in wound management to treat that if they do. So there can be lots of factors that affect the patient's ability to move, but also sometimes there's a patient's desire to move, which we don't always think about. Also, patient's uh, perception of pain can impact that as well. So the most studied causes of impaired mobility are patients who are hospitalized, um, who all of a sudden have some type of fracture, uh, spinal cord injury, and then also something we don't often think about is our infants and neonates, especially with um, preterm uh, pregnancies. Nutrition is huge, as we talked about um, in our first lecture, and it is the second most common risk factor. So really checking out those albumin and prealbumin levels are very important, also monitoring for the patient's hydration. So the less uh, nutrition they have, the worse the ulcer severity usually is. That's been correlated in studies. And keep in mind that the patient's size doesn't, isn't really an indicator of nutrition. They can be um, obese, um, what we'd consider a normal weight, or um, they can also be underweight. So you want to make sure that you don't look at the patient and make a judgment about their nutrition just based off of looks. Impaired sensation is a risk factor as well. If patients are unable to detect pain when the tissues are becoming ischemic, they will not reposition themselves like you or I would and they may go on to develop a pressure injury. So if you think about it, when you sit in one place for a long time, like during a lecture or a church or in a car, um, we kind of get these subliminal signals sent from our body to reposition. We cross our legs, we shift our weight, we lean back, we do all these different types of things without even really thinking about it. Even at night, we roll over, um, we reposition our pillow, we stretch without even really realizing that we're doing that. When patients aren't able to detect um, pain, they can um, stay in that same position for longer than they normally would. Examples of that would be listed below. Spinal cord injury comes to mind a lot. Um, patients with neuropathy, um, secondary to diabetes, um, those types of folks that have any nerve ending damage um, would be at very high risk for a pressure injury development. You're going to start to see a theme here that anytime someone is geriatric or of advanced age, they're at a higher risk for um, basically every type of wound and they have a reduced healing capacity. So what age is that? There's not really a specific number. Usually we start to think about 70 as being of advanced age, but I know all of you have probably seen people who are 50 and they seem like they're 70 and they've met people who are 85 who seem like they're 60. So age is kind of a relative number. But just remember that as we have advanced age, we have a higher risk of pressure injuries for lots of different reasons. Um, Age-related skin changes is, once, is one reason. Um, patients usually have a lot of different comorbidities and they just have reduced um, sensation and more mobility overall. As we talked about during normal wound healing, even after a remodeling of 18 months to two years, a patient is only uh, a patient's skin in that local area is only 80% as strong as it once was. So patients who've had a previous pressure injury are at a very high likelihood of developing another pressure injury in that same area. So you have to make sure that you teach the patients um, to monitor their skin in that area, to set up a plan for prevention of reoccurrence, um, and to try to remember that depending on the situation, the initial factor that uh, kind of went into causing the pressure injury may not be able to be reduced, such as a spinal cord injury. We're not able to all of a sudden cure that spinal cord injury, so we have to be really vigilant about controlling all of the other factors that we're able to. Although we've talked about the major risk factors contributing to pressure injuries, there can be a lot of, a lot of other factors as well. So you have to make sure you do a thorough history, um, do a good general exam with your patient and kind of take into consideration critical thinking um, about what all could be contributing to their pressure injury development. So here's a few additional listed examples, um, but there, there are many more than this as well. For all of the major wound types, we're going to utilize what we call the 5PT method. And this is just a method to think through um, the characteristics of the different wound types. So those five P's that we're going to um, look at 
are pain, position, presentation, peri wound pulses, and then the T stands for temperature. So we're going to think about those with each of the major wound types. So the first P in our 5PT method is pain. So when we're thinking about characteristics of pressure injuries, um, patients with a pressure injury may have pain or they may not have any pain at all. So try to think for a second why, why that might be. P some patients, depending on the situation, may not have perception of pain as we talked about before. So. One thing we'll want to do for assessment is try to find out from our patient through a questionnaire, um, maybe a visual analog scale, um, or um, the face as pain scale, depending on your patient type. So stage one pressure injuries, when there's non-blanchable erythema, they might be tender instead of what we would consider painful. Um, as I said before, remember that not all patients are able to, de to detect pain, which might be a contributing factor to why they have a pressure injury in the first place. And then some patients are not able to communicate um, that they are having pain, so we have to utilize um, physical expressions of pain such as grimacing, withdrawal, or moaning. The second P is position, so we have to think about the position most of our patients are in when they develop a pressure injury. So approximately 50% uh, or more of the pressure injuries that are developed are on the lower half of the body, usually over a bony prominence. So the majority of pressure injuries occur over the sacrum, greater trochanter, ischial tuberosities, the heel, and the lateral malleolar um, area. So I did say before that pressure injuries really can occur anywhere, but the good majority of them um, occur over these few places. Areas of outside pressure causing pressure on the body can be from casts, tubing, or shoes. So make sure that the intervention that you're providing or maybe that you're, you're an intervention that you're helping to manage isn't something that's contributing to a pressure injury. Inquiring about the positions that the, your patients spend the majority of their time in will give you a clue as to how these areas developed or if you're thinking about prevention, uh, making sure that you're inspecting areas that might be at high risk. So. If a patient's in supine, you can see the areas here that are uh, most likely at risk for pressure injuries. Um, in prone, you can see the examples below. I've had patients that sleep always on one side and don't ever sleep any, in any other position. Uh, that puts them at a high risk for pressure injuries. You also want to think about patients who are in a seated position as well and what areas would be at high risk. Presentation of pressure injuries varies highly depending on the depth of the tissue involved or the different types of tissues involved. It can range from intact skin that has a non-blanchable erythema, so when you press your finger in, it should turn white and then return to red, and in uh, initial stages of pressure injuries, that tissue remains red the entire time. It can range all the way to full thickness ulceration involving um, any range of tissues all the way down to the deep structures. Unless previously debrided, uh, usually the base of, an, of a pressure ulcer is very necrotic and the tissues are not healthy and non-viable. Unstageable pressure injuries usually have a thick black eschar so you're not able to see the base of the wound so we're unable to accurately classify that until we remove that thick black eschar. Next we'll look at the peri wound. So most of the time the patient, especially if you're first assessing the pressure injury, will have non-blanchable erythema. So you'll push that finger in on that tissue, it will stay red the entire time. It can also have a mottled appearance, uh, inflammation surrounding the ulcer, and they may also develop a dermatitis around the ulcer, especially if there's a lot of weeping fluid. In assessing pulses with patients with pressure injuries, if they develop one on, let's say, the heel or something like that, pulses may pay, play a big role. Otherwise, sometimes they're usually not applicable depending on the location of the ulcer. Um, you also have to, especially if they're on the lower extremity, consider peripheral vascular disease. The last letter is T, 
and that stands for temperature. So in areas with pressure injury development, there is increased temperature due to reactive hyperemia, and um, it may be decreased in areas of ischemia. So you really want to take a look at the temperature in the local area and the surrounding area for comparison. So this is a study that was shown um, looking at the time uh, related breakdown of tissue. Now remember the inverse time pressure relationship, so this can vary quite a bit. Um, but what I wanted to point out here in the pictures on the right is you can see with high resolution ultrasound that this would be normal tissues on the heel. And on the right, the actual tissue damage is deeper and closer to the bone and we really don't see anything on the skin surface at this point. So we want to make sure that we're understanding um, kind of the level of, of tissue necrosis and death that can occur before we're able to, te to detect that on the skin surface. So usually we see hyperemia occur, you know, anytime in less than 30 minutes. We start to see um, ischemia over a number of hours. So we do want to be repositioning our patients at least every two hours, if not um, sooner. And we start to see necrosis or cell death in approximately six hours or greater. And then as I said before, when you look at the abnormal heel on the right, the ulceration on the skin surface might occur fairly quickly or it may take up to two weeks from the initial injury to um, expose itself on the skin surface. Next we're going to go through how to stage a pressure injury. You're going to want to make sure that you're able to correctly identify and stage pressure injuries. Um, not only for clinical practice, but we do see this um, on the board exam quite often. So. This is set up by the National Pressure Injury um, Advisory Panel. That actually changed to NPIAP, um, I think last year. So a few tips are that you want to document what you see with your eyes, but also you need to use your hands and palpate and document what you feel. Um, another thing to understand and remember is that what you stage on one day can worsen over time. So if you evaluate that patient, remember that there's a lot of tissue damage deep and it may not be revealing itself yet. So you, so you may um, always stage the patient worse over time if that ulcer develops um, and presents itself as worse. What you cannot do is reverse stage pressure injuries as they heal. So if they were a stage three, as they're healing in, they do not become a stage two and a stage one. They always stay a healing stage three pressure injury. So they always stay the worst level that they uh, presented themselves as. Another mistake I commonly see out in clinical practice is that you only stage pressure injuries, not other types of wounds. Okay, so other types of wounds are described as partial thickness, deep partial thickness, and full thickness. Pressure injuries are the only types of wounds that you stage with this method. One additional reminder is that we have to have consideration for patients who have non-Caucasian skin and how that may present a little bit differently. So you have to look for more subtle changes or subtle differences in color, uh, temperature, and how the tissues feel. All right, let's take a closer look at stage one. So stage one is defined as intact skin with a local area of non-blanchable erythema. So on the bottom left, you can see the difference between blanchable, that's where the skin is red, but the blood capillaries are still responding. So if we use our finger to press into the skin and close down the blood capillaries, they turn white. And then when you remove your finger, they immediately turn red again. Non-blanchable, right next to that, is when you push your finger in and the blood capillaries are not closing down or responding. So you can see a picture of a real patient on the bottom right that has a sacral stage one pressure injury. So the further description is that stage one pressure injuries have the presence of blanchable erythema or changes in sensation, temperature, or firmness. So there you are with the being able to palpate and feel. Color changes do not include purple or maroon discoloration. Those would indicate a deep tissue pressure injury, which we'll talk about uh, in staging in a future slide. As we move to stage two, we now see a partial thickness loss of skin with removal of the epidermis and the exposed dermis. So the wound bed is viable, moist, pink, 
and also can present as an intact or ruptured serum filled blister. So remember we do see that quite often um, on testing questions or on the board so make sure that you remember serum filled blisters are stage two. So as you can see here on the top picture the cross-sectional that we see a partial thickness loss of skin where the dermis is exposed and that's what we also see on the bottom as we're taking a look there. We don't see any slough um, or any dermis um, or any depth to the dermis there. So we're not seeing in the further description any adipose tissue, we're not seeing any granulation tissue, slough, and eschar. These types of stage 2 injuries commonly result from adverse microclimate, so we talked about temperature, we talked about shear in the skin over the pelvis and heel, and we have to make sure that we're not utilizing this stage 2 to describe moisture associated skin damage, incontinent associated dermatitis, um, any other type of dermatitis including intertrigo where we get um, moisture under skin folds, medical adhesive related skin injuries which is removal of tape and kind of peeling the skin off and it's also not used to describe traumatic wounds such as skin tears, burns, or abrasions. So remember that a stage 2 pressure injury is only staged um, when we're dealing with pressure injuries, not any other type of damage to the skin, although they may present looking very similarly. In stage 3, we now see a full thickness tissue loss, so that means into the dermis. Adipose or fat can be visible in the ulcer and granulation tissue and epiboly, which is the round rolled edges, are often present. Slough and eschar can also be visible as well. So you can see in the pictures on the right um, that we see a full thickness tissue loss, we see granulation tissue in those wounds, and we do see slough in those wounds as well. So the further description is that there's a depth of tissue damage that might vary depending on where the location of the ulcer is at. We can see significant adipose uh, develop in the large wounds. Uh, tunneling and undermining may also occur, so we have to make sure that we're probing the wound and measuring that. And remember that deeper structures such as fascia, muscle, tendon, ligament, cartilage, and bone are not exposed. So we're not seeing those in a stage 3. If we see any of those structures, we're going to stage that as a 4. Additionally, remember that if we cannot determine the base of the wound or see the bottom of the wound, that we cannot call it a stage 3 until we're able to see the bottom of the wound. That would be considered an unstageable pressure injury. With stage 4 pressure injuries, again, this is a full thickness tissue loss, but now we're extending into structures. So we're able to either directly visualize or palpate fascia, muscle, tendon, ligament, cartilage, or bone in the ulcer. We can additionally have slough and eschar, as we could in stage 3. Um, oftentimes we'll have epiboly or rolled edges. We'll oftentimes have undermining and tunneling occurring as well. So the depth is going to vary, again depending on the anatomical location. Sometimes there's a lot of tissue there um, where, where we'll see a deep depth measurement. Sometimes, like on the back of the scalp, scalp, there isn't a lot of tissue there, so we may be all the way down to the bone or the connective tissue of the scalp um, with little to with very little measurements. Okay, so now we've covered stages one, two, three, and four but there are some unique additional staging definitions and one of them is unstageable pressure injury. So this is also a full thickness skin and tissue loss, however we're not able to see the extent of the tissue damage and we cannot confirm how deep it is because of our vision is obscured by either slough or eschar. So if the slough or eschar is then removed, you can then reveal the base of the wound and stage it at that time. So stable eschar, where it's dry, it's adherent, it remains intact, and it doesn't have erythema or fluctuance on a heel should not be removed. Anywhere else we do want to remove the eschar from the wound bed to determine the base of the wound.
The next category is a deep tissue pressure injury. So a deep tissue pressure injury presents itself as a purple or maroon colored localized area of discolored skin that remains intact or it could be a blood filled blister um, due to damage of the underlying soft tissues from pressure or shear. So these kind of help us to understand that iceberg um, type of analogy. So the tissue damage is deep. So the, the fact that it's bleeding and has a purple discoloration tells us that it must be full thickness because we're at the level of the blood capillaries. So this area might start out feeling painful, firm, mushy, boggy, or have a temperature difference of being warmer or cooler when you compare it to the surrounding tissues. So once again, you have to utilize your palpation skills. Further, um, further description is that deep tissue injuries can be really difficult to detect in patients with very dark skin tones. So again, you have to palpate. You have to watch this area over time because the evolution may, may um, include a thin blister over a very dark wound bed. And that wound go on, may go on to reveal itself um, and it, there may be damage all the way down to the bone, um, in which case it would be staged a uh, stage four. A couple of years ago, the pressure injury uh, staging was uh, modified to include these two new pressure injury classifications. The first one is a medical device related pressure injury. And so with this, the patient um, develops a pressure injury resulting from any type of medical device that's applied um, for diagnostic or therapeutic purposes and it has a side effect of developing a pressure injury. So the clue for that is that the pressure injury will be the exact shape or pattern of the device and the injury should be staged using the staging system. A mucosal membrane pressure injury is found on mucous membranes with a history of a medical device in use at that location. Due to the anatomy of the mucosa, you cannot use the staging system for these types of um, injuries and you just call them a mucosal membrane pressure injury. We're going to briefly talk about um, prevention utilizing support surfaces. So the capillary closing pressure, or the amount of pressure applied to the skin surface to close off a blood capillary is about 32 millimeters of mercury. So when we talk about support surfaces, they kind of categorize them as pressure relieving or pressure reducing. Pressure relief provides a less than 25 millimeter of mercury interface pressure, and pressure reduction is 26 to 32 millimeters of mercury. There's also a couple other terms. Um, immersion is when you sink into a surface or the give of the um, pressure relieving device that you're sitting on. And then the second one is envelopement, um, which determines, or sorry, which deforms around the irregularities. So if you're sitting, the cushion will sink in and deform around the, the um, exact um, shape of the buttocks. It will contour to you. So we're talking about pressure redistributing devices or pressure relieving devices. Um, we could spend, you know, two days learning only about this topic. So we're just going to kind of hit the surface here. Um, but anyone really at risk for a pressure injury who's not able to have full volitional repositioning ability should have a pressure relieving uh, or redistributing device. So if you work in long-term care, and you evaluate a patient and they're not able to completely roll over in bed, they should have a pressure relieving device in bed. If they're not able to stand up from their wheelchair or perform a wheelchair push up or shift their weight, those patients need to have something underneath them in the way of a cushion uh, to redistribute the forces. So um, that goes for acute care, pediatrics, um, long-term care. So a lot of different patient types that we're working with. So let's play a little game here. We're gonna have um, you start a little stopwatch here or take a check on your clock. And I want you to sit without moving or shifting for as long as you can. Um, you may notice that 
in a few minutes as we're continuing to go through slides, you might not even realize it and all of a sudden you crossed your legs or shifted in your chair or whatever it is. You might be watching this and listening to it in bed, but you'll roll over or something like that. So see how long you can go without moving. It's actually pretty hard and you actually start moving um, pretty quick. So patients should reposition every 15 minutes if they're able. A healthy individual without even realizing it repositions themselves every 15 to 20 minutes even during sleep. So our patients um, that we're working with we usually want to at a minimum reposition them every two hours at night if they're not able to do it on their own. So go ahead and play that pressure game and, and um, <laughs> if you're brave enough you can check for your own reactive hyperemia. So if you're sitting uh, you might want to check after a few minutes when you first notice that you shift and see how red uh, you are in the certain areas that are having a lot of pressure. One of my recommendations down at the very bottom is that if a patient is not able to roll themselves, if, they're, if you work in home care or long-term care or acute care, that they should at a minimum have an alternating air pressure mattress. You can buy these on Amazon for about $70. They plug in and there's little tubes, lays right over the top of your normal mattress and air goes in one tube and out of the other and then the opposite tubes inflate and deflate so that the patient's never having pressure on the same tubes on their body at the same time. So just a quick way that you can implement um, a really pretty cheap way to prevent a pressure injury depending on the settings that you work in. Next we're going to talk about neuropathic ulcers, which are also known as diabetic ulcers. Um, usually they occur on the foot, so often called diabetic foot ulcers or DFUs. This is a big one guys. Over 24 million Americans have diabetes and this number just keeps growing and growing and growing each year. Um, once a person has diabetes, the lifetime risk of developing an ulcer is about 25%, so that's very high. Um, and if a person develops an ulcer, they also have a very high risk of that leading to an amputation, ultimately morbidity and mortality. Next we're going to talk about uh, neuropathic wounds and with that usually we're talking about um, neuropathic uh, diabetic foot ulcers. So the etiology of diabetes related tissue damage is um, patients have hyperglycemia or elevated blood sugars and that changes the red blood cell function the platelets and the capillaries and that alters our blood flow so we actually have ischemia uh, in these local areas these vessels start to harden and they're not very responsive so it increases microvascular pressure so the proteins in the area also become glycosylated so we'll start to see increased rigidity um, in that area and fibrosis and that can cause tissue trauma in the local area as well. Additionally in the local area we see an accumulation of sorbitol when um, the, the glucose starts to break down and that results in tissue destruction in the local area as well. So we start to see a lot of bad effects of a hyperglycemic um, a hyperglycemia in the local area. One of the major risk factors for neuropathic ulcers and delayed healing is uh, blood flow, so looking at vascular disease. So patients with diabetes are at a very high risk for peripheral vascular disease. We see atherosclerosis develop at a faster rate, so their blood vessels become almost like they're calcified, so we don't see nice elastic blood vessels and function. We see a thickening of the basement membrane. We once thought that you know blood flow and vascular disease was really the most, um, the most impactful factor, but we now know that it's neuropathy. However, these two do um, both occur frequently, and when you have both a neuro neural component and a vascular component, you really set this patient up for failure um, and inability to heal. So when we're dealing with neuropathic diabetic foot ulcers, we really know that obviously neuropathy and function of our uh, neural system is very important. It's the most common complication with diabetes 
So what actually happens is the nerves become demyelinated and so they don't function as well and we see neural ischemia happen. We usually see a stocking glove presentation, so it's usually symmetrical and it's from distal to proximal. And then keep in mind that it affects not only our sensory but also our motor and autonomic neural systems as well. So let's take a closer look at that. With our sensory neuropathy, approximately 50% of our patients are unaware that they have even lost protective sensation. So doing that monofilament test with a 5.07 or 10 gram monofilament um, in the 10 testing positions is gonna be really important just in general for therapy screening if we have any patients that have diabetes. Um, they may be unaware that they have sensory loss and you can really spend a lot of time in, with those patients in prevention and um, doing daily foot checks and in monitoring um, so that they don't develop a, a neuropathic foot ulcer in the first place. So early detection and prevention is really key. These patients may be presenting to you with paresthesia and so we want to make sure that you're screening for this, documenting and communicating with um, our physician friends. Then we're going to take a closer look at motor neuropathy. So what happens here is that the intrinsic muscles of the foot and ankle start to develop weakness and atrophy. So with this, usually we see what we call kind of a hammer toe um, presentation of the foot. This decreases their foot stability. You may be seeing this patient for falls or balance issues. You really want to hone in and look at um, their foot function and structure. Um, when the foot starts to deform and we see these um, hammer toe presentations, the first metatarsal usually becomes very prominent as well as all the metatarsals. They start to lose the fat pad there. The dorsum of the toes um, elevate and rub and press on the tops of the shoes and the tips of the toes then um, make a lot of contact during toe off. So we see increased pressure and shear forces in areas of the foot that are not meant to function in that way. And then don't forget about autonomic neuropathy. Um, a lot of these automated processes are sometimes forgotten about, but they're also extremely important. So um, if we lose the ability to sweat or moisturize our skin, the skin in this area can become dry and cracked. We also see significant increase in callus formation. And that callus can increase pressure underneath the callus and cause bleeding um, and ulceration, kind of similarly to how a pressure ulcer develops. We also see arteriovenous shunting, which decreases the perfusion to the area. And um, when the blood vessels or blood capillaries stop functioning normally, we see uncontrolled vasodilation. And when that happens, um, the bones can actually respond by fracturing and developing osteopenia. Mechanical stress is huge with these folks. Um, they're developing abnormal or excessive forces in certain areas. And when that happens, it predisposes them to ulceration. Uh, due to um, micro trauma. So if we don't control the trauma or stop the trauma, we're never going to get these folks to heal up. So high plantar pressures really overload the tissue's ability to repair itself. And that's due to, as I talked about before, claw toes or a cavus foot or hammer toes. Another risk factor contributing to neur neuropathic ulcers and delayed healing is abnormal foot function and inadequate footwear. So we need to make sure that we're inspecting the footwear that patients are utilizing. Um, we want to make sure that we're documenting their range of motion. So I think that's missed a lot of times um, in non-therapist wound clinics. So we're experts at looking at range of motion, um, uh, gait, function, um, so we need to tie all that together and use our expertise to help these patients. So with impaired range of motion, we often see um, great toe extension, dorsiflexion, and subtalar joint mobility are reduced. When that happens, we see increased vertical pressure and horizontal shear on the bottom of the foot, and that's what tears the layers apart and develops the ulcers. With foot deformities, we often see a plantar flexion contracture. We may see some changes in varus or valgus. And then the patient may develop what we call a shark hoe foot. And that's where we can actually see significant changes and fracturing that uh, results in kind of a, the bottom of the foot presenting like a rocking chair. Unfortunately, um, if a patient goes on to develop an ulcer, um, that results in amputation. There's approximately a 40% reoccurrence in two years 
poor ulcers and they may end up having to have their foot um, foot amputated unfortunately and then from there um, morbidity and mortality are both significantly affected so we need to make sure that we're inspecting the patient's footwear poor fo footwear does not protect the foot it decreases pressure and shear on the area we want it to decrease pressure and shear um, and we want it to accommodate foot um, deformities so Medicare does pay for patients with diabetes to get one new custom pair of shoes per year, so make sure you're educating your patients about that and getting them um, custom footwear. Another risk factor for patients with diabetes is that they have impaired healing and immune response, and this affects all the, the phases of wound healing. So it affects the ability for them to um, create an inflammatory response. It affects their ability to repair the wound and develop granulation tissue and fill in that wound deficit. And also it highly affects um, the remodeling process. So our patients are at higher risk for infection. They're not able to build nutrition, uh, build tissue in that area. Um, we see an increased frequency of infection of the bone called osteomyelitis. We see increased soft tissue infections and we see increased um, yeast infections called candida. Another risk factor with diabetics is poor vision. And you might be thinking, well, how does poor vision impact a wound on the bottom of the foot? Um, the reason for that is because if patients have poor vision, we have an increased risk of trauma. They're not able to visualize the bottom of their feet. They're not able to see hazards that they normally might be able to, and they're not able to perform their own adequate footwear. All right, so let's talk about some ulcer characteristics with neuropathic diabetic foot ulcers. So usually the ulcer characteristics here are that they're larger and deeper wounds in general and they do take a much longer time to heal. They usually are present for a longer period of time than other wound types. Another disease characteristic as we know is that the patients have poor glycemic control. And so when they're not doing a good job of controlling their blood sugars, they're at an increased risk for long-term complications. So we really want to take a look at their fasting glucose and also their A1C. I've had patients bring in their glucometer and test at their therapy visits because I'll ask them how their blood sugars are doing and the, you know, I'm, I kind of question whether or not maybe they're being truthful. So an A1C is a better long-term indicator of how they're doing with their um, control of their blood sugars. But sometimes just for... Um, adherence to programs, you might want to have them bring it in and just kind of check that there in your clinic so you can document that objectively. So complications can be improved or re reduced when the patients improve their glycemic control and that's the goal. We want to treat the patients inside as well as outside. Inadequate care and education is also a risk factor um, contributing to delayed healing. So a lot of times our folks are not even understanding that they have diabetes or what does that mean? What are all the complications that can happen? So they're lacking kind of that cutting edge knowledge. Many times we see delayed referrals. So we can be seeing these patients, let's say for um, a fall that they had, um, and we can play a key role in many different um, aspects of this patient's overall health. So we wanna make sure that we're seeing these patients as soon as possible. Many times there's poor adherence by these patients to clinical guidelines. Um, I kind of use the example of, you know, if you have diabetes and you eat a donut, there's no immediate ramifications to that. I mean, there's not a, an immediate side effect. It's kind of a cumulative um, effect of not doing the right thing over a long period of time. So a lot of times patients don't tie their behaviors directly to a consequence. So as I said, there's minor short-term complications when, they, when they're not adherent, but there's major long-term complications, and some of those can be life-threatening, such as ulcers, amputation, blindness, and kidney failure. Many times patients don't understand that link between glycemic control and their long-term complications, so it's important that you work with a diabetic educator, um, work with a dietitian, work closely with the patient's um, primary care provider. And then, unfortunately, when patients do start to develop neuropathy, that absence of pain um, also decreases their short-term effects um, or consequences. And so it, it tends to decrease the patient's adherence. So you may have them in protective footwear, and they don't uh, feel anything on the bottom of their foot, so they don't realize walking across the house um, when they might step on a, you know, a little something might have really significant ramifications.
So what are some PT tests and measures for neuropathic ulcers? Definitely, we talked about the impact of um, circulation on these patients. So you want to look at pulses. You may utilize a Doppler ultrasound. You'll want to be familiar with and able to practice an ABI in your clinic. And then you'll also want to look at the microvascular through the capillary refill. The other major risk factor is sensation. So we want to use our Sims-Weinstein monofilaments to determine the patient's level of being able to protect their feet or look at their lack, their um, protective sensation. So 5.07, uh, 10 gram monofilament is associated with a lack, a lack of protective sensation. You can also go up or down from that category to further determine the patient's uh, sensory abilities. Once again, this is not something that you need to memorize, but I've given you an example of a Michigan neuropathy screening instrument. So this is kind of a neat one because um, a lot of times we're looking at clinical objective information, but this has kind of a history that the patient can go through and answer themselves um, that go through a lot of the risk factors. And then there's a physical assessment that you would perform in the clinic. So read through that, just kind of familiarize yourself with it and utilize it out in clinical practice um, once you get out there as a therapist. All right, now let's take a look at the characteristics of neuropathic ulcers using the 5PT method. So the first one is pain. If you think about it, these patients usually are not able to perceive pain, which is a problem. So the lack of pain um, uh, impacts their ability to be adherent to their program at times. Sometimes the patients may have pain that's more related to um, a paresthesia. Where are these um, ulcers located? They're usually located on the plantar aspect of the foot, usually on the metatarsal heads, although they can be in other areas as well. Midfoot is common if the patient develops a Charcot deformity, and that's where I talked about um, the, the foot actually fractures in the midfoot, and it develops kind of a, a shape like a rocking chair on the bottom of the foot, so it would make sense that the most prominent area there is the midfoot. These, often, um, these ulcerations often occur under calluses. So calluses get really thick. It's like if you or I were to, were to walk around with like a couple of coins taped to the bottom of our foot and it creates pressure and trauma between the callus and the bony prominence. You might start to see some bleeding out into the callus and then you know that the deep tissues are being injured. Additionally, for position, these ulcers might occur where there's pressure or friction from inappropriate footwear. So I've had a diabetic foot ulcer occur on the, on the medial portion of the great toe because of a, a bunion. So that is in a weight-bearing area, but if the patient's walking and their shoe is rubbing or creating a, a, pressure, a pressure point, um, you may see some diabetic foot ulcers occur in different areas because of something like that. So how do these diabetic foot ulcers present? Usually these ulcers are round uh, or they might be oval. And they'll look kind of like a punched out lesion so there'll be very defined borders to them. They're gonna have a calloused rim. So a hyperkeratotic rim is gonna be a classic cardinal sign of a diabetic foot ulcer. Usually there's gonna be pretty minimal drainage because there's not a lot of blood flow usually in this area for these folks because of ischemia. Um, unless they're infected, then you might see a lot of drainage pouring out of that uh, wound. They can develop eschar or necrotic material. Um, however, it's not real common unless they develop an infection. So what does the peri wound look like with these folks? Um, due to autonomic neuropathy, the skin is dry and cracked, and we already talked about callus being present. So keep in mind you need to take a look at the whole foot and how it's functioning, how it's shaped, how the patient ambulates. So looking at um, claw toes, rocker bottom foot, um, do they already have an amputation, especially um, on their other side? Um, have they had some of the toes removed and how does that change function or shape of the foot as well? Pulses sometimes are hard to detect um, with these folks. Sometimes the vessels uh, start to calcify due to atherosclerosis. So they might be normal or they could be accentuated. Um, for temperature, usually the temperature is fairly normal, but it might be increased if the patient has an infection or if they have um, microtrauma going on, they may have some reactive hyper hyperemia. All right, so here's an example of a diabetic neuropathic foot ulcer on the bottom of the patient's left foot over the first metatarsal. 
I would tell you that this is probably about the prettiest you're ever going to see for a diabetic neuropathic foot. Usually, um, you know, you're not going to see a wound that clean, that nice. Um, you're not going to see um, a patient having all the toes. You're going to see cracking, fissuring, uh, significant callus. So this is about as good as it gets right here. I would say this is more typical of what you'll see for a referral um, to wound care for a diabetic neuropathic foot ulcer. So you can see this patient has two areas right now that need to be addressed. Um, some people might only unfortunately address um, the one more distally, but if you take a look at the lateral foot, you also see some callus and beneath the callus or into the callus you see bleeding. So you know that there's actually trauma going on there beneath the callus and the um, between the callus and the bone. So we need to address both of those areas. You can see on the distal wound that there is the typical classic sign of hyperkeratosis um, or calcification around the ulcer. You can see that this patient has had uh, previous uh, toes amputated. You can see that this patient has um, had a Charcot foot development. So you can see that the, the flattening of the midfoot, um, which is contributing to that ulceration over the lateral part of the foot. So this is after intervention. So we went ahead and cleaned this foot up. We debrided the callus around the distal wound and um, improved the wound edges there. We also went ahead and debrided off layer by layer to remove the callus um, on the lateral foot. This will help the patient to be able to heal um, much more appropriately. Um, and then we definitely need to address the patient's uh, footwear, um, gait, range of motion, etc. So here are some visuals to help you understand Charcot foot a little bit better. So on the top is a Charcot foot and on the bottom is a normal foot structure. So you can see how with fracturing at the midfoot, we start to see a rocking chair presentation or kind of a rocker bottom on the bottom of the foot. So this changes the pressure points and the at-risk areas of the foot. We start to see some skeletal damage secondary to the neuropathy and we start to see osteoarthroplasty where the joints start to dysfunction. We see pathological fractures and foot deformities develop. And this is due to um, poor function of the nerves. So the foot intrinsics start to um, decrease their function. And then we see the vascular component leading to these pathological fractures. So this patient might be coming into you in an orthopedic setting, complaining of swelling, um, pain, um, limping, um, there might be, you know, a concern that they sprained their foot or, you know, something along those lines. So you have to do a really good job of utilizing your differential diagnosis skills. So Charcot foot goes through uh, four stages. The first one, the patient uh, presents with a hot, red, swollen foot with bounding pulses. So this might be a time when they might see you in an orthopedic setting just wondering what's going on with their foot. Stage two, we start to see fractures. Um, we start to see tissues dissolve in the area and start to fragment. In stage three, uh, the wound then, go, or sorry, the internal um, fractures and dissolution start to develop into the rocker bottom foot um, that we see as the typical long-term deformity. In stage four, unfortunately, because of that development of an abnormal deformity and shape of the foot, we start to see plantar ulcerations develop. Those can lead to infections, um, gangrene, and even amputation of this foot. So we have to get them into accommodative footwear as soon as possible. Once again, I just want you to be aware of some um, neuropathic foot ulcer grading and classification systems. You do not need to memorize these, but just want you to be aware that they're out there and kind of understand what goes into them so that you can understand how that relates to um, risk factors for development. So the first one is the Wagner and the second is the University of uh, Texas method. So the next course is going to talk about treatment or intervention, but just wanted to give you a few things to think about at first. Um, we really want you to focus with your patients on good glucose control and doing a lot of education. Secondly, we're going to learn in 754 about total contact casting. 
And basically what that is, is you apply a plaster cast to the patient to immobilize the ankle and immobilize the foot, which decreases um, shearing forces on the bottom of the foot. Additionally, um, this controls fluctuations in edema and helps to kind of suspend the patient up into the cast, bearing some weight through the lower leg. And when you put the cast on, it makes total contact with the bottom of the foot instead of having the patient um, make contact or increase shearing forces over one small area of their foot like the first uh, med head. It distributes those forces evenly throughout the bottom of the foot so that um, it's evenly distributed and that wound can go on to heal in that focal area that's being impaired.